Many experts think that in order to counterbalance China today, the West needs India more than it ever did before. But does that also mean that this new attitude in the West will also help in stopping the negative stereotyping and vilification of India in the Western media outlets? But wait a second, what exactly is this vilification and negative media stereotyping of India and where and how can we see it? Well, the first point that I would like to raise is about the insensitivity towards India's indigenous cultures and people. You may have heard the story of John Allen Chow, who went to India's Andaman and Nicobar Islands to convert the Sentinelese tribe to Christianity. But do you also know how this story was reported in the Western media? According to the article in the British newspaper, The Guardian, the people of North Sentinel were damned and the American missionary was determined to save them. Well, I don't quite understand the mentality or ideology that refers to anyone as damned just because they are not Christians. But why do so many Christians think that way? Many also find it ironic that on the one hand, these Western nations are often seen talking the loudest on preserving diversity and pluralism. They have the privilege of being permanent members of the UNSC and have a powerful voice in the United Nations, an international organization that aims to defend our cultural diversity. But on the other hand, it appears that these Western nations are also the source of many expansionist forces which threaten our global diversity by homogenizing our world on religious grounds. Well, the article in The Guardian also mentions a large and sophisticated apparatus that exists to assist Americans interested in proselytizing. It also mentions that the American man who wanted to convert the Sentinelist tribe to Christianity was accepted to a boot camp run by All Nations, a Kansas City organization that works to see Jesus worshipped by every tongue, tribe and nation. According to The Guardian article, Databases such as people groups and the Joshua Project gather information on what evangelicals call unreached people groups. Indeed, the article is very enlightening in terms of what is going on in these Western nations. But I still fail to understand why the article in the British newspaper referred to Sentinelist tribe as damned. Now, let's move on to the next point, which is about selective and misleading use of metrics. Have you noticed that the Western media quite frequently use the per capita metrics in their analysis when it comes to comparing India's GDP with the GDP of developed nations, but then, on the other hand, when it comes to comparing India's emissions with those of the developed nations, they are hardly seen using the per capita metrics? Why? Are these developed nations afraid that by using the per capita metrics for emissions, they might end up looking far worse than a country like India? And by the way, can the Western scholars and the Western media also stress more frequently on metrics like consumption-based emissions, ecological footprint and historical emissions, so that we can see where India stands and where these Western nations stand? The third point that I would like to raise is about the documentary films which mislead or spread misinformation about India. To give you a few examples, have a look at this documentary which was published on the YouTube channel of Deutsche Welle, which is Germany's international broadcaster. At 4th minute and 12th second of the film, the Hindi word spoken by this Indian lady, Manajo Sankarshkia Ubahud Bara Sankarshhe, were wrongly translated as we were considered slaves. If the German media outlet wanted, it could have taken down the video, got the mistake corrected and then have the video reposted again. But no, it chose to just leave a comment underneath the video admitting the mistake, which many viewers will not even read. Yes, mistakes do happen in journalism, but after all it is Germany's international broadcaster, not some independent YouTuber with limited resources who is hesitant to take down a video that has already gone viral. Well, regardless of how horrible and offensive this wrong translation of these Hindi words is, perhaps in its defense, the German media outlet can always say that the mistake was unintentional and it never meant to hurt anyone by this. But then how would you explain other incidents of foreign media spreading misinformation about India, especially those cases in which it was actually the intentions that were questioned? The BBC's documentary, India's Daughter, is a good example. Christopher John Penrith Booker, who was an English journalist, author and a founder of the satirical magazine 
Private Eye highlighted the tendency of the Western media to negatively stereotype Indian males. In his article in The Telegraph, Booker wrote, Those who saw the preview of India's daughter in Delhi have testified that the original version did make comparisons with the rest of the world. One, Anna Vettigat, praised it as a balanced documentary because it ended with worldwide statistics highlighting violence against women from Australia to the US. But when the final version emerged, all this had been cut out. India was shown standing alone as a country where rape is an exceptional problem. Here is another example. In 2011, in an extremely embarrassing situation, the BBC had to apologize for a faked footage of child labor in its show Primark on the Rack, which was broadcast in June 2008. The show involved the Bangalore scene. Not only that, the BBC had even won the prestigious Current Affairs Home Prize at the Royal Television Society Awards for that program, an award which it later returned. The fourth point that I would like to raise is that while talking about India, quite frequently the Western media shows the slums, poverty and the not-so-pretty locations of India. Repeatedly using such footage does not help in creating a broader perspective in viewers' minds regarding India's appearance. Now give this a thought. How many times have you seen the Western media showing this type of footage while talking about India? Even though we have limited resources, on our channel we took the initiative to show these sides of India which were otherwise lesser known. After all, why should the international audience not know that India can also look like this? Many also feel that the Western media outlets can do a lot better in terms of the way they refer to people of non-Western origin. After all, why are white people considered experts when more often than not, everybody else is considered an immigrant? Mauna Rima Kutonel notes, Expert is a term reserved exclusively for Western white people going to work abroad. Africans are immigrants. Arabs are immigrants. Asians are immigrants. However, Europeans are expats because they can't be at the same level as other ethnicities. Finally, let's focus on the most important question. How does this negative stereotyping by the Western media hurt Indians and India? Well, the way both Indians and India are perceived and understood globally is not only related to the country's trade and tourism opportunities, it can also contribute to the rise of the anti-India sentiment in the West, which can result in racism and discrimination against Indians. For example, in 2015, in Germany, a Leipzig University professor, Sikinger, barred an Indian student from an internship. She stated, We hear a lot about the rape problem in India, which I cannot support. The situation became so serious that eventually the German ambassador to India had to intervene. He wrote a letter to Professor Sickinger in which he even went on to mention India is not a country of rapists. The situation is not too pretty in the UK as it was revealed that 34% of British people would prefer Britain to still have an empire. How terrible is that? What factors are responsible for such attitudes of these people? Is the Western media also a contributor? Well, according to the Soft Power Fair to Report, media coverage of India is often unhelpful and unflattering. The report also says that the British media house, the BBC, is a valuable soft power asset for the UK. If that's the case, then is it right to say that if the soft power assets of the former colonial powers vilify a formerly colonized nation like India, which is trying hard to rebuild, India's journey to prosperity will get tougher and the anti-India sentiment will rise? No, it doesn't mean that Indians don't welcome good-hearted criticism. My previous episodes are good examples. I published an episode on racism and discrimination in India. Our Indian viewers appreciated that. I published an episode on India's poor waste management. Our Indian viewers welcomed that too. In order to ensure that we find the best available solutions to our global problems, some of my episodes have also surfaced the not-so-pretty sides of the West. But then, I have also highlighted the good sides of the West that a nation like India could learn and adopt. Instead of stereotyping or shaming any country, community or people, shouldn't we all come together to learn and share so that we can find the best solutions for our problems? Namaste, my name is Karolina Goswami. 
Accurate presentation of facts is very important to my work. So far, I have published more than 200 episodes on our YouTube channel as I have been trying my best to help the global community to understand the complex and lesser-known sides of India. But our limited financial resources slow down our work and create many hurdles. Please come forward to contribute to our work financially. See you again.